Hey guys, I think I think it's working now. Hopefully it's working back for a second lesson here on September 1st and 2nd. And I, on Tuesday, Wednesdays, a lot of times I'm going to do this just because I had a hard time uploading a longer lesson. So I'm just going to do two, sh I don't know, 15, 20 minute lessons. And today we're going to get into chapter three. So we're going to move into chapter three, which is good because we got to keep moving. Okay, I promised you a joke. So here we go. I think this one's better than on the first video. Why did the man dance in front of the bottle? Why did he dance in front of the bottle? Because it said twist to open. Twist is a dance. So there you go. Those are your talks for today. Okay, so today we're going to get into chapter three, and we're really going to kind of pick up the pace here a little bit. Not so much today, but as we get into this and all this, I can I just sense you guys are doing good. You guys are just reviewing and hopefully feeling good. I, maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm not. If you have questions, ask. Okay, so here we go into chapter three. Here is the uh, the problems that I want you to do from chapter three. Okay, and just like always, I am um, I'm not going to collect these, but these are the problems I would recommend you guys doing. Recommended problems just to make sure that you guys are going over the stuff that I could put on the test. And like I said, we're going to get into, into moles and all that. Not today, but in Chapter 3 we are. And again, I don't foresee us coming to a test for at least probably till the end of September. And, and you know, as long as we're still meeting, we'll st we can still be doing labs. So. Okay, so there's the problems for chapter three. And so you guys got things, you know, you guys, we have a lab coming up. You got a quiz due in the next class. You got those works, practice worksheets. You got problems from the book. You can be working on memoriz memorizing the polyatomic ions. So there's a lot you can do. So this one is going to be the dreaded stoichiometry. And, and this first slide is one of those that's um, nothing I'm going to hold you to. But using the periodic table, by definition and agreement around the world, one atom of carbon-12, and, and there, there was a disagreement when they do, were doing this about some chemists wanted this to be based off the mass of oxygen and some off carbon. And I don't know why the carbon-1, but carbon-12 is the basics, basis for all the other atomic weights. It weighs 12 atomic mass units. All the other elements are relative to this weight. And one AMU, remember an AMU stands for an atomic mass unit, is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. And that's a number you'll never need to remember. But if you take the reciprocal of Avogadro's number, you take the reciprocal of that, you get Avogadro's number. I'm going to make sure I'm not lying to you on that. So if I take 1 divided by... 1.66, second exponent, negative 24. Sure enough, there's Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if you want to remember that, what, what, what one AMU is equivalent to, there it is. <clears throat> okay, the next thing, and we're going to have a few instruments that we're going to use in lab. This one we're never going to use. It's called a mass spectrometer, but in class... I guess not on, on um, Wednesday, Thursday, but on next Monday, Tuesday, I have a short little YouTube video that I'll show you on this. But it's a method of determining the mass of particles. And so I, I'm just reading here. If something is the kind of the principle behind a mass spectrometer, which is something that could be one of the questions on the multiple choice part of the AP test. If something is moving, you, uh, you subject it to a sideways force. Instead of moving in a straight line, it will move in a curve deflected out of its original path by the sideways force. Suppose you have a cannonball traveling past you and you want to deflect it as it went by. All you've got is a jet of water from a hose pipe that can squirt at it. Frankly, it's not going to make a, a lot of difference because the cannonball is so heavy, it will hardly be deflected at all from its original course. But suppose instead you try to deflect a table tennis ball traveling at the same speed as the cannonball using the same jet of water because the ball is so light, you will get a huge deflection. The amount of deflection you will get for a given sideways force depends on the mass of the ball. And that's what happens here. So what happens is, is a particle is, I'm reading here my notes, accelerated through an electric field 
pass by a magnet and the key part is there at the end where it's curved and the heavier it is the the less it's going to curve kind of my analogy and the lighter it is the more it's going to curve so by comparing deflection of carbon 12 relative weights can be determined and what you end up collecting is you collect the the mass or, or the amount of each isotope <clears throat> hits on different places on the plate and you can figure out what is the percent of each isotope in a, in this example of a of an element so here's an example of what uh, the data that could be given. This is uh, examples of mass spectrometer. And <clears throat> this represents three isotopes of the same element. And the, the, um, the ion, the, the vertical axis is referring to the percentage of what there, what is there. And the bottom number is their atomic mass. And this, and you can see on the graph on the right, 91% is mass of 20. 0.3 is mass of 21 and 9 is 22. And this is the element neon. And if you look at the, on the periodic table, neon, I'm looking up here, neon has an atomic mass of 20.1797. I'm going to go over here in a second in how that is calculated. <clears throat> so that is the data that a mass spectrometer produces, is it gives you the percent abundance of each isotope of an element. Okay, so here's an example problem. So here, uh, is a, a problem where we've got the relative number of atoms or on the vertical axis or the percent. And this is copper. So it says determine the average mass of copper. So if I, what I'm going to do here then, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct, and we actually did this, but it wasn't a very big part of our, uh, class in, in first year chem, but I'm going to conduct a little table, I'll make a little table, I'll have mass times the percent, and I'll put the percent in decimal form. So I'm going to take the mass, so I have copper that's 63, and I have copper that is 65. So the mass at 63, according to the data that's given in the problem, is 69.09%. So I always put that in decimal, 69.09 in decimal, 0 0.6909. And then we have copper that weighs 65, and its percent is uh, 30.91. So again, I put that in decimal. Okay, and this is one place I don't worry about sig figs. What I usually do here is I just go out to the hundredth. So I'm going to go 63 times 0.6909. And I'll do that when I round. When I round, I'm going to round to the, I'm just going to round. When I'm doing atomic masses, I'm just going to go to the 100. A lot of periodic tables, that's what they go to. Then I'll do 65 times 0 0.3091, 20, 0 0.0915. And now I'm going to add these up. And again, I'm going to round these to the, uh, to the 100. So I get 63. 0.62, and the real unit on this is an AM. So what we did there is we found the atomic mass of the, uh, from that data, from the element uh, copper. Okay, so now let's go back to where we were. Okay, so that we solved, we, we solved for the mass of copper. Now I'm going to do the mass of hydrogen, or carbon, I'm sorry, for this. Sorry, I'm just going to leave that up because I know how to do this with this. But it says 98.99% of carbon is carbon-12. The remaining 1.11 is carbon-13. What is the average atomic mass of carbon? So again, you could stop it and you guys could do it, but I'm going to do the same thing. So mass times the percent. So I've got carbon-12, so that weighs 12, and it is 98.99%, so I'm going to put that in decimal. And then I've got carbon-13, and the problem told us that it was, the mass is 13, so I've got carbon-13, oops, I'm sorry, I need to 
writing on the board here and you guys can't see it. Okay, so I'm back. So what I did is I did the carbon 12 and the mass times the percent in decimal form, not carbon 13, but the problem told me that it, the mass of the carbon is 13.003355. And then the percent is 1.11% in decimals, 0 0.011. Okay, so now if I do this, and again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to round this. at the end to the hundred. Okay, and if I add these up. What I get is 12.02. And the unit really is an AMU. You know, it could also be correctly, the unit could be grams per mole. That would also be an acceptable unit for that. Okay, so what we're doing here is we are solving for the atomic mass of different isotopes given data from a mass spectrometer. Okay, let me just go here, and then this is where we're going to start the next time we have notes. Uh, this way, at least, we have forged into Chapter 3 a little bit. Okay, so we did both of these. Okay, and now the mole, and of course a big thing, and I could do trumpets or Star Wars movie, but the, of course the mole is a big thing. And the number of carbon-12 atoms and exactly 12 grams of carbon-12, which is Avogadro's number. And more broadly, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of any element equals its atomic mass. And so this is, this is a picture here then of one mole or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd at, uh, molecules of each one of these, like copper's on top and that zinc on the left. To be honest with you, I'm not sure. Um, sulfur on the bottom. It looks like maybe mercury in the middle. Okay, I'm going to stop there, guys. You're doing good, but you got to stay disciplined and keep up the work. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, lab, your first quiz is due. I will. I will see you guys then.